All right. Our next presenter is Kim Updegrove. Dr. Kim Updegrove. She has dedicated her career to saving babies' lives and caring for women and children around the world. She's a registered nurse and a certified nurse midwife. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing at William Patterson University, a Master of Public Health degree at Rutgers University, and a Master of Science degree in nursing at the University of Pennsylvania. After finishing her MSN, she left the Penn faculty and moved to New Haven, where she worked as a CNM, delivering more than 500 babies and providing well woman care. She also served on the graduate faculty of Yale University School of Nursing. She joined the Mother's Milk Bank at Austin in December of 2002. And now, serving as executive director, she oversees the financial and personnel management and all clinical aspects of the Milk Bank. She's past president of the Hambana and chairs the Standards Committee helping to ensure safety and quality control of donor human milk and cultivates the development of nonprofit milk banks. She's been invited to numerous states, to Canadian provinces, to China, Korea, Mexico, Poland, and Turkey to foster and mentor milk banks and to speak at regional, national, and international conferences on breastfeeding, milk banking, and women's health. She's been quoted in local media, as well as ABC News, NBC News, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and CAPQC. Help me welcome her as she presents her talk, Nonprofit Human Milk Banking and Pasteurized Donor Milk, Optimizing Safety and Accessibility. Okay, all that makes me sound a million years old. I'm not quite a million years old, close, but not really. I am so honored to be here. Um, Georgia State became uh, on my radar in a big way about five years ago um, when CDC's in pink scores showed that, that there was a serious milk desert here. And as the executive director of the Mother's Milk Bank at Austin, I decided that that was something that I wanted to do something about. So part of my talk will be what the Mother's Milk Bank at Austin does here in Georgia and what you can do to pick up those efforts. So I didn't get any kind of uh, instruction. So, oh, look at that. <laughs> okay, so let's dive right in. And I realize how dangerous it is to be the last speaker of the day and especially to follow Jennifer. So if you need to stand and get the wiggles out or if you need to ask a question, Please deal with me informally, do that, and, uh, and let's learn something at the same time. Okay, so you already know who I am, way too much about who I am, actually. Um, I have no disclosures other than I am a paid employee of the Mother's Milk Bank at Austin. And here's what I want to cover. I want to cover how did we get here? How did donor human milk come about? Because I'd love to point out the founders of all of the milk banks as these brilliant uh, physicians and nurses and advocates, um, but there's actually a long, long history that they are drawing from. Um, I'm gonna talk a lot about the safety and quality of pasteurized donor human milk and talk about uh, MMBA and, and Georgia. And then finally, what challenges remain? I'm going to cover that all in the next 45 minutes magically. So for this talk, when I talk about donor human milk, I am speaking specifically about not-for-profit service. So I'm talking about the milk banks who are 501c3. They are responsible for screening and uh, the donors recruiting and collecting milk from those donors and processing, screening, storing, and distributing donated human milk. And I'm also just talking about pasteurized donor human milk. There are lots of for-profit entities and nonprofit entities doing lots of interesting things. I'm gonna talk about the science and technology associated with the proven pasteurized donor human milk. And one of the key elements of that is that Donors are true to the definition of that word. 
Milk donors donate their milk. They are not paid when donating to a 501c3 nonprofit milk bank associated with the Human Milk Banking Association of North America uh, and audited and accredited by Himbana. So what is that history? It's wet nursing for more than 2,000 years, right? Mothers have taken care of other mothers' babies. When those mothers were no longer here on this earth, community stepped in. Sometimes they were forced to step in. Slavery, a caste system, a debt. Sometimes they were paid. In this own country, you can look at advertisements for, for wet nurses mothers who might have an extra supply of milk and be paid to feed another person's baby. This is a floating children's hospital ship. It existed in the Boston Harbor uh, in 1910. I show this picture, A, because it's fascinating. In 1910, healthcare providers knew that people in cities were not as healthy as people in the countries. We didn't want to send our pediatric patients and our NICU patients out into the country. So what was the answer? Send them out into the harbor, put them on a ship and get them technically out of the city. It's a fascinating problem-solving solution um, that didn't quite get it right. But nonetheless, I'm fascinated about it because on this ship running the NICU was a Harvard-trained physician named Dr. Talbot. And Talbot looked around at the community in Boston and said, oh, those people who are sharing their milk with other mothers' babies are leading to a healthy community. And I have a problem in my NICU. I think I need that in there. And so he developed a one-year-long one study where he brought women in from the community who passed a rudimentary screening process, and he had them express their milk and feed babies in his NICU. And he studied their outcomes, and his attempt was to decrease morbidity and mortality from feeding intolerance. Now that's a real diagnostic code. At the time, it was a euphemism, euphemism for when a child in the NICU couldn't tolerate the hospital-made formula, no commercial formulas yet, and that baby developed an intestinal obstruction, perforation of the intestines, and then died of sepsis. So he wanted to decrease the rate, and at the end of the year, he increased morbidity and mortality in his NICU overall but he decreased morbidity and mortality from feeding intolerance because he learned what the community had learned that human babies tolerate human milk. They just can't have human milk brought casually in from the community with no hand washing and clothes changing. And as we have learned now, no pasteurization. But nonetheless, that was the first milk bank in the United States. And since then, there have been a number of key changes. The American Academy of Pediatrics paid attention to this in the 1940s, and they developed the first formal guidelines because what happened was milk banking took off, got, was popular because it saved babies' lives in the NICUs, but every hospital was doing something different. So the AAP attempted to standardize some guidelines. It also is important to know that, that milk banking became very closely aligned with blood banking. We are not the same uh, fluid and we are not processed the same way. But nonetheless, it was really clear that a body fluid can carry various things that are both harmful and helpful to another human being. And the AABB noticed that. And so some of their guidelines are incorporated into our regulations because they matter. Milk banking proliferated all throughout the 1900s. In the 60s and 70s, when formulas had become commercialized in the 50s and specialized formulas became available in the 60s and 70s with preemie preterm specific formulas becoming readily available in the 70s, donor human milk started to be replaced. We started to see it uh, decrease in its use within hospitals. And then 1980 hit. And when we identified AIDS, 
That then raised a question about every body and tissue industry. And there was very little clinical studies on donor human milk, its safety, its standardization, infant outcomes. And because there was little information, most of the milk banks then were then closed. There were 23 milk banks in Canada at that time and 30 in the US. And when I walk you through the history of the Mother's Milk Bank at Austin, I'm gonna say that we were fifth in the nation in 1999. That's how bad and devastating that AIDS crisis was. We have learned since then and respond a whole lot quicker to things like Zika and uh, Ebola and then COVID. We jump into the research and publish safety, safety under what circumstances, what do we need to worry about? But one thing that came out of the AIDS crisis and the closing of the milk banks was the development of an organization that then and now oversees and sets the regulations and accredits nonprofit milk banks. The Human Milk Banking Association of North America was formed in 1985. It is a member association, but it also links the individual milk banks with research and holds those individual milk banks to the standards or regulations under which each one must function. Today, there are 28 milk banks in the United States. This, this map shows them all and three in Canada. There are multiple developing milk banks. I hope that Georgia's developing milk bank uh, will make it to this map. Um, it is important to know though, that while there isn't a milk bank in every state, every state has access to donor human milk. It's not the same as having a milk bank in your community. And I'm using community as state. Having a community milk bank means that your population gets a whole lot of information about the importance of breastfeeding and understands the safety of donor human milk as the primary breastfeeding substitute when mom's milk is not available. But your state is served and I'll just show you some data on that in a couple of minutes. It's also important to know that since Himbana was formed in 1985, and first standards came out in 1989, there is a crystal clean safety record. There's not one negative outcome from the use of pasteurized donor human milk from a milk bank accredited by Himbana. That's a really big deal as we look at lots of other industries entering the milk bank world calling themselves a variety of things and providing a variety of products. We are the ones with the data and the safety record. I feel very proud about that. Himbana's mission, vision, and values are upheld by the organization itself, and, and they're upheld by the individual nonprofit milk banks who are accredited by Himbana. But mostly what we hold up as an indication of whether our regulations or our standards are meeting the needs is a baby like London. A 24-week baby today, actually in my own city, a 22-week baby. A 22 or 24 or 26 or even 34-week baby who is born with challenges. Those challenges require human milk feedings to decrease the rate of a number of complications. So the milk banks exist to make sure that that happens and that it happens safe, safely. So one of the ways that we make it happen safely is that Himbana has a standards committee. In full disclosure, I chair that committee and have for the last 15 years with a very incredible team of people. We write the standards under which every accredited milk bank must follow. And there are certain influences besides the baby on those standards. The US Food and Drug Administration does have regulatory authority over nonprofit milk banks. We are oddly regulated by them as a food manufacturer because <laughs> 
because they don't have specific regulations for human milk. And when we look at all of their categories, like exempt infant formulas, for instance, those categories exist for a product, a food product that has things added and extracted from it that is made in a manufacturing plant. The thing about human milk banks, nonprofit milk banks accredited by Himbana, is that it's a single ingredient product. Multiple donors, but single ingredient. We don't take anything away other than what we deliberately destroy via the pasteurization process, and we don't add anything into it. This is good, and from a neo perspective, this is bad. Human milk is amazing, right? It's absolutely miraculous, but it's not the placenta. It's not the mother feeding the baby directly in the womb. It's different. And so it's not all that, but that's not what this lecture is about. Other sources of oversight. So all of our state departments, usually departments of health in Texas, I have lots of departments that like to get involved. So our state departments get to have a say about what we do and how we do it. My state department of health comes in and inspects me. They know very little about human milk, but they come in and inspect and say, oh, looks like you're doing a good job, which is awesome. My state department of public safety comes in and inspects the kinds of locks and security I have in the facility, which is super cute. And they also know nothing else. And so they say, oh, great, good job. That's awesome. And we have local boards of directors. So um, lots and lots of bosses, but again, it's the baby. Together, Himbana and the FDA are who ensure safety. And the accreditation is the evidence of safety. From the FDA's perspective, they get to decide that FISMA and their good manufacturing practices and their food code are all applied to milk banking. We are all registered with the FDA and keep that registration current. That's a federal law. They make inspections. They make inspections in a funny way. I bet you all work in or are associated with hospitals and so are so used to JCO. And JCO gives you this cute little window of opportunity warning. They're coming, they're coming. We all scramble and we get things ready and then we let them in the door. The FDA does something really odd uh, to me, they show up at the door without warning. And I've had multiple visits from them. They're uh, a little bit intimidating. They show a badge, they have a real badge. And they show a contract that says that, that they are here and I understand that they're here and have authority and that I have cleared my schedule for as long as it will take. And it takes them two days. Um, but in the multitudes of visits that MMBA has had from the FDA, there have never been any findings, and I am super proud of that, and also not surprised. The FDA also gets to say what kinds of, of specialties we have in the milk bank. So not only are they interested in how we follow food manufacturing regulations, but they want to make sure that we have a safety expert and quality expert in the facility. So what they call a PCQI, they demand at least one per milk bank. Uh, so we have four at MMBA. I like to have duplicate authority. And then Himbana's authority over the nonprofit milk banks, they do on-site audits. They're scheduled. You know that they're coming. They're annual. Trained auditors are PCQI um, certified and have at least five years of experience in milk banking. We currently have five auditors for the continent. I am one in full disclosure. It's a three-day audit um, where we basically review everything about how that milk bank is working and make sure that they're following the standards. Together, we make sure that this single ingredient product is safe for the most vulnerable of infants. One of the things that is uh, a rule across the board is that the type of pasteurization in the nonprofit milk banks is holder pasteurization. It is the only type for which we have clinical data showing the safety and quality of the milk once it goes through that processing. 
It's the cornerstone of safety. And I can't say this enough. There are many, many cute, interesting things you can do to milk. And you better believe that I am involved in research myself. But the way that we make pasteurized donor human milk is the same in the US and Canada and in many other countries because it's documented to be safe. We know how to make safe milk for these babies. So Jennifer does a really good job about talking about neck. And I know you know all of the statistics about human milk and neck, the reduction of 75% of the risk if we just provide human milk only feedings. Um, so enough said on that. Let's talk about what these safety standards are. So to begin with, the first level of safety begins with screening the lactating mother. I know she's safe enough to feed her baby. I get that. That's not what we're interested in. I want to know, is she safe enough to feed Micah? Is she safe enough to feed the smallest babies that I have ever delivered? I've delivered babies a little over one pound. They're terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And I am delighted to turn them over to all of you who are neonatologists in the room and then to take care of the parents, because that's not my field of expertise. But milk is, and mothers are, and so donors are screened. They get interviewed, first verbally, then in writing. That can happen in either order, but very intense questions about their medical and lifestyle choices and history and current status again, might be safe to feed their babies. I got to make sure that they're safe enough to feed ours. Once we are sure that their report of their histories and their current medical status are good, it isn't good enough. Their healthcare provider, the one that gave them prenatal care, labor and delivery care, and postpartum care, and they might be multiple people, need to provide statements about their health as well. They need to provide the blood work results from their prenatal care. They need to provide a list of diagnoses during the time period they were taking care of the person and a list of any medications that that person is on. Once all of that information is in, a minimum of an, a licensed RN must review that chart and verify that everything looks fine, that she's okay to donate. She might be a healthy mother with a healthy baby, but she might be a healthy mother with a preterm baby or the healthy mother of a baby who didn't survive. She could also be a surrogate. As you heard from Jennifer, she could be Jennifer with one living and one deceased child. The outcome of the screening, she could be permanently deferred. If she's on long-term medications, meaning she takes them every single day, things like antihypertensives or anti-seizure medication. She cannot be a donor and we will not advocate her stopping those medications. Her healthcare provider prescribed them. I have to believe that that was a correct decision and therefore she cannot donate her milk for babies. She may choose to have an alcoholic drink every day. I'm not gonna get involved in what's right or wrong about that. No judgment here other than you can't be a milk director or a milk donor. Milk donors can have an alcoholic beverage, but they have to wait six hours until they pump their milk and donate that to the milk bank. That's a long time I get, but uh, it is our rule just to make sure that there isn't one tiny little bit in that milk. We used to defer for a lot of herbal supplements, and now I'm super pleased to say that with a lot of work with pharmaceutical agents, um, pharm pharmacologists, um, we've investigated all of them, and now there are just a list of 10 bad herbs. Everything else is allowed. Things like fenugreek that used to keep people from being donors are now okay. A lot of the folks who go through the screening process are temporarily deferred. They're on appropriate medications, but we can't accept the medications. And so they finish up that short-term 
prescription, things like amoxicillin for sinus infection, not going to get between a woman and, and healing her sinus infection. She's got to finish that medication and then wait five times the half-life. Five times, not the half-life, because five times it eradicates 98% of that medication's capability in the human body. That way I can then calculate how much could possibly be transferred in the human milk, and it's so minuscule that it's not a worry. I have a feeling, since this is an old slide, that this is not the uh, up-to-date presentation, so let me just say that I'll uh, wing this a little bit. But she also has to agree that she has ongoing communication with us once she's approved. She has to have a conversation with us, a kind of mini rescreening uh, at the minimum every eight weeks to make sure that she hasn't been prescribed something new. She hasn't had uh, an illness in the family that uh, would impact her ability to become a donor. The standards committee has a medication advisory committee. So this is a group of pharmacologists and neonatologists, people who balance out our expertise. They took a look, take a look at each medication that we commonly prescribe to a lactating woman. And they evaluate it for the chemical and physical uh, factors that might affect how much of it can transfer into human milk. They also, with us, take a look at the typical recipient, the Londons or Micahs of the world, and evaluate if the baby gets that much through human milk from that mother, what would be the effect. This is enormously helpful to us and has allowed us to um, have a very concrete list of medications that are absolute no-nos, and then medications whose five times the half-life could serve as the deferral. So about 50% of the moms who go through screening get approved, and it isn't that 50% are bad. All 100% are good people, but 50% of them don't meet our standards to feed these particularly vulnerable infants. We let them down gently and remind them of all the other good things they can do in the world. They don't need to pump and donate to the milk bank. The milk arrives in the milk bank. It might arrive because the donor is local to a milk bank. It might arrive that, uh, via a depot, which is close enough to a milk bank to be couriered. And it might arrive by overnight shipping via UPS or FedEx or DHL. If it is shipped, it's shipped with dry ice with cold chain verification device inside to make sure that the milk that she pumped in her place is frozen at the time that it arrives at a depot or leaves her freezer, stays frozen through that 24 hour transportation and is frozen when we open it at the milk bank. But that's not good enough. This is the old presentation. I don't suppose that anyone has any capability of uploading the current one. I'll assume no and just talk my way through it. Um, you're going to miss some data that I'm going to try to get for you. Um, arriving at the milk bank as raw milk from approved donors just means that it is safe enough for me to provide that milk to my staff and my medical students. They can take it into the lab and begin processing it. It is not safe enough for your vulnerable infants. This is milk that is just safe enough in its raw form for us to to fool around with. So we're gonna do a bunch of things to it. The first thing that we're going to do is to take that milk and link it with the medical record of the person who donated it. That person has to have two identifiers, could be name and date of birth or unique five digit donor ID that she has uh, provided with her uh, milk donation. On those bags and containers of milk that she sends, she has written the pump date so that we can compare that pump date to any temporary deferrals that she has. We're also going to examine each of those bags or containers for any breaks, for any indication that uh, something has happened to this milk. It might have thawed and refrozen. We're going to look for any problem and we're going to throw out anything that doesn't meet our standard. 
It's cruel, but necessary, again, for your babies. We're gonna log that milk in month long increments because milk changes over time and I need to be able to predict some things about the immune products and micronutrients in this milk. And then we're gonna to apply to bar, a barcode to this milk, this logged milk deposit so that I can track it through the milk bank and say where it is at any given time. And then I can track it all the way out to you in your individual hospitals, clinics, or communities so that I can say definitively, this person's drop of milk was in these multiple pools and it went out to these multiple babies so that I can study the outcomes. And just in case we had any reason for a recall, we'd be able to find it and recall it. This milk is pumped in the mother's world and no offense to the mother, but for any of you who have ever pumped milk, I wanna know if you ever looked at that container of milk and saw that sometimes inadvertently we get our own hair into it or clothing lint or our favorite pet's hair or maybe if we're really lucky, we pumped that milk and we put it down on the counter and we didn't put the lid on it yet. And we walked away to take care of a toddler and a dog and the doorbell. And I'm not an entomologist, but uh, so excuse the use of this term, but an ant crawled up and got in that bottle. Well, we examined that milk when it came in and we logged it, but we're going to filter the milk as well. We're looking for any contaminants in this milk and we find it inadvertently. So after we log the milk and we choose the milk for processing on any given day, we thaw it and we filter it. Then we take that milk and we pour it into bottles in which it will be pasteurized. And we pasteurize it using holder pasteurization, 62.5 degrees for 30 minutes. It is just enough to eradicate the bacteria to eradicate the viruses, to maintain most of the macronutrients, to maintain most of the micronutrients, to cause some havoc with some of the things that we'll take a look at, and to be safe to dispense to you. The evidence of safety after the milk goes through all of its processing and is pasteurized is a microbiology culture. One bottle from every batch of milk is sacrificed. It's painful. Whether it's a 45 cc bottle, a 90 cc bottle, or a 200 cc bottle, it's enormously painful to sacrifice that bottle, but we're gonna open that bottle and we're gonna take a sterile sample and we're gonna send that to an external lab who don't care whether this is a safe batch of milk or not. That lab is going to follow a 48 hour protocol, culture that milk and attempt to grow anything from that milk. Now, holder pasteurization destroys all of the bacteria in human milk, but does it? One bacteria in your environment, safe in your environment for you, so don't panic. Don't put your pen in your mouth, but don't panic. Bacillus cereus gets picked up from the environment, can contaminate milk, and be present in an inactive or active form in that raw milk. If active, those of us who do cultures before pasteurization can see it and discard that milk. Yay. If inactive, all of the milk banks pasteurize the milk and Bacillus cereus loves heat. So when we pasteurize the milk, that spore, that inactive bacteria can become activated and grow, colonize, be present. We can't give you milk with Bacillus cereus in it. We can't give it to you with a hundred colonies or one colony. So we have an external lab test the milk, verify that it is or isn't in there. I can tell you that on an annual basis, we discard about 3% of our milk because it is in there. And we take that milk and throw it into the trash. The CDC right down the street says that we can throw it in the trash, no special treatment, but you don't get it 
because you can't get it. When we took a look at the microbiology cultures of all of the milk prior to pasteurization, we see a ton of bacteria. We see lots of skin bacteria. We sometimes see GI bacteria, but we also see bacillus uh, series species. And so that's what we are challenged to destroy during the pasteurization process. We also at MMBA see uh, Staph aureus, whether plain Staph aureus or methicillin resistant Staph aureus. It is not a requirement by Himbana, but we discard that milk as well. I don't have any clear evidence that it's a problem, but I have clear cases in my history as a clinician of babies who developed a Staph sepsis and I couldn't find the cause and we look, you know that we look really hard. So for my personal ability to sleep, we destroy Staph aureus milk. The milk is all labeled. The FDA says that we have to label where the milk was processed. So you see that on the cap of the milk. You see our caps, our, our capped labels in different colors. That's not a standard across milk banking. It's purely an understanding that I think at some point in a 24 hour cycle, every single healthcare provider like me is brain dead. And it happens for me about 20 minutes from 4 a.m. till about 4.20 a.m. before I can get some protein and before I can acknowledge that this is a new day and I'm really okay, even though I haven't slept since the night before. The color code indicates the caloric density of the milk. We do macronutrient testing and targeted caloric and protein pooling. So, so the label color is about that. We're not just being cute in the milk bank. It actually does mean something. The way that you know it means something is that the label on the side of the milk gives you information about the pool and batch number, the expiration date of this milk, one year from the earliest pumping date of anyone's milk. And for us, we put 80% um, of the protein, we put the true protein on the label to give you an indication of what a preterm baby will absorb out of the full protein in this milk. Did you make my zapper stop working? Never mind. Wow. Okay. okay. So the recipients of donor human milk are mostly in the NICUs across all of the nonprofit milk banks. Most of the milk goes to babies in the neonatal intensive care units in PICUs as well. But in the NICUs, the primary reason is that they're premature. They're just born too small, but they could also be born too sick or too uh, soon. I'm sorry, the primary reason for dispensing milk is that they're born too soon. They could also have a malabsorption disorder, feeding intolerance, an immune disorder. It's used for trophic feeds, of course, one cc every three hours via a feeding tube. Um, we have long since adopted that process. In the hospital, the goal is to provide human milk only feedings. An exclusive human milk diet is how we uh, eliminate a majority of the causes of neck. Um, so neck is the primary, avoidance of neck is the primary goal for us. Um, the goal is to reduce other complications and improve outcomes as well. And we are interestingly seeing evolving recommendations for babies who are born with significant cardiac uh, and GI disorders as well. And over the past couple of years, new recommendations for babies who are healthy term babies, who are in the maternity and well baby units, um, who need just a little bit of milk to uh, have exclusively human milk diets. You know that there are a number of authorities calling for exclusive human milk diets for the very low birth weight infants. Um, it is these organizations are the reason why we prioritize those 1500 gram and smaller babies. But the growing use in the community is really pretty interesting. And there are lots of factors that are leading to this. 
for both chronic disorders and acute disorders in the community, we are seeing more and more pediatricians prescribe donor human milk. It may be an issue of a mother who doesn't have her milk and she's tried multiple formulas and the child is diagnosed with formula intolerance. Um, this is a difficult diagnosis to prove. It's um, it relies on a lot of history from the, the parents of the baby, um, can be very difficult to prove. Although if we can document weight loss in an infant, we certainly give the baby lots of attention there. But there are also social drivers of the use of donor human milk in the community, and they're not certainly in my control. The formula crisis over the past 18 months has been a significant problem for the milk banks. It's not our problem to feed healthy infants in the baby who were in the community who were successfully feeding off of formula. But it is our problem to rely or respond to crises, especially in the infant feeding world. And the formula recalls and shortages caused a crisis in the infant feeding world. Even though those babies didn't qualify medically for donor human milk, they had a feeding issue. And so families who came to milk banks with the serious story of not being able to find formula and feed the baby uh, immediately, we're able to get across the country a small volume of pasteurized donor human milk to carry them just a little bit of the way until we could help them identify different uh, retailers who might have formula for them, different WIC clinics who might have a supply, sometimes even hospitals who were um, perhaps hoarding more supply than they might have needed. Parents are suddenly informed and asking for pasteurized donor human milk as well from the community. Baby-friendly hospitals help drive this and uh, an increasing knowledge of some of the risks of informal sharing. All of these things lead to greater requests from the community for pasteurized donor human milk. I appreciate that and I support getting human milk to all human babies. But I'm telling you, there is not enough human milk in the nonprofit milk banks to feed all human babies. So these healthy community babies are able to get some milk sometimes, but only after we make sure that every hospital is served. And that's an important point. So the Mother's Milk Bank at Austin, Transition here to talk about MMBA and Georgia, although I suspect I don't have Georgia's slides because no one's looked at me and said they're switching over my presentation. So I'm going to do it from memory. Yes, you could do it. Yay, thank you. You're a miracle worker. This is all my fault for changing the presentation two days ago and not checking in with people. I just like to do that. Um, so MMBA was formed in 1999 for exactly the reason why Jennifer formed the Next Society. A neonatologist in 1998 admitted two 24-weekers to his NICU. One lived, one died. After five months of living in the NICU, one was able to receive mom's own milk and one received formula because that mom didn't have milk. The one who received human milk Interestingly, her mom had ample milk, but we didn't have a milk bank to make it safe. So they lived side by side for five months. And at the end of five months, little girl went home, little boy died from neck. And the neonatologist, Dr. Sunny Rivera said, enough is enough, not dealing with this anymore. No baby ought to die for lack of human milk. There's a way to make it safe. Talbot knew it in 1910. Why the hell are we not doing this? Um, he's a really good friend. He really does talk like that. But um, nonetheless, we tolerate that. So he called his buddy from another hospital system, Dr. George Sharp, and together they formed the milk bank and we opened in 1999. And they said, because they believe in miracles, that they would eradicate neck and do it so well that they'd do it in Austin and then give everybody the technology and science and the how-tos. 
So in 1999, we opened, dispensed 10,000 ounces to those two hospital systems. George Sharp was the statistician of the two neonatologists. He knew that the rate of neck in the very low birth weight infants in Austin at that time was 9%. At the end of that first year, it had dropped to 1%. Now, I was all the way over in Connecticut and celebrated that news, but they in Austin were saying, yeah, we failed. What are we going to do about this last 1%? Um, they are both really good friends of mine. George Sharp is deceased now, but Dr. Sonny Rivera is still my research partner. So they got over it and they agreed that they actually had done something really amazing. They had figured out that by opening a nonprofit community-based milk bank that could serve any hospital system safely, we would save babies' lives. And vastly decreased the rate of neck. And so we kept going. I joined the milk bank in December of 2022. We, uh, sorry, 2002. I don't want to be this old. We expanded our reach as far as we could based on the milk supply at any given time. And as you can see now, we dispense just under a million ounces per year. Some of it comes to you. This is our reach. There are 28 milk banks around the United States. We do things a little bit differently and took a leadership role in the research and uh, standards. So uh, we serve some hospitals in states where there are milk banks just because we do things a little bit differently. Our milk donors, largely we have 100 per month, but that green line is that very unusual year when we identified COVID-19. Something weird happens when you send working mothers home and you close the daycare centers so the babies are home. And because it's a new virus and we don't know anything about it, you say to the mom, hey, you have to come back to the office when I say you have to come back to the office, but for now you're home and your baby is home. So keep pumping but hey, it's a lot easier to breastfeed. So breastfeed too. Well, everybody made a ton of milk and then realized they weren't going back to the office anytime soon. And so we saw a great increase in the number of donors. They also, since we closed the restaurants, we were cooking more. And so we needed our freezers for different reasons. So I heard lots and lots of reasons for this. It was a really fun year. I'm happy to have that behind us. Here are some things that are unique about the Mother's Milk Bank at Austin. In 2001, we were approached by neonatologists around the country who said, figure out why babies' growth rates in the NICU are so wonky. They're all over the board. And you know, we don't like unpredictability in the medical world. So they said, figure it out. And it's happening whether it's mom's milk or donor human milk, but we like the predictability of the growth rates with formula-fed infants. We just don't like their medical outcomes. So figure it out. So we looked around at different industries and we saw that the USDA was using a FOSS electric machine called a MilkoScan, their term, not mine, to evaluate your bovine milk. If you drink cow's milk, this is the machine that is calibrated to tell you definitively whether you are getting 1% or 2% milk. We said, ooh, we want that, please. And so they bought that. Um, they lent it to us. They bought it for themselves. They lent this $100,000 machine to us because we said, oh, we can recalibrate that. It's a full laser spectrograph, so it can recognize anything that you can identify the wavelengths for. So we haughtily said, we'll just recalibrate it and read human milk. Well, that took two years. I'm not super proud of that but it led to some really interesting data. At the time, we interviewed neonatologists and they said, hmm, human milk, it's all the same. It's all 20 calories per ounce. And we don't know what the protein level is, but yeah, it's all the same. So the babies should grow at the same rate. So we thought that was kind of interesting. We took that information And we took, let me back up a second. 
We took that information and we calibrated the machine and I tested 1500 samples of milk from 1500 unique milk makers in the first 12 months after delivery of their infants. I had a variety of lactational ages, length of time since she had given birth. And I tested that milk. And what we found is that it varied in composition from about 12 calories per ounce in expressed milk to about 30 calories. And there was a cute little bell curve that was pretty steep at about 19 calories, but there was a good variety, right? So those of you who work in a NICU know that if we're feeding a two pound baby 16 calorie milk for mom, we have a problem. It's mom's milk and it's perfect, but we have a problem. So they said, fix that. We uh, relayed that information to the American Academy of Pediatrics Conference in 2004. And after the jaws came off the table, they said, fix it. So we developed a technique called targeted caloric uh, pooling and targeted protein pooling. So we educate the mothers about how to properly express their milk, maximizing access to the fat, the widest varying macronutrient in expressed milk. But it's sticky, so it's hard to get out sometimes. We log differently. That's when we started logging in month-long increments. Every time we decide to process a mom's milk, and we process about 50 different mom's milk per day, we do a macronutrient test in the milk scan. So we use one one-ounce sample, and we take a look at it. And when we know what her fat, protein, and carbohydrate content is, we target pool to meet a caloric standard and a protein standard. And we have multiple caloric standards. So 20, 22, and 24 are our standards for NICUs. And that means that the, milk, the protein needs to be a minimum of 1.1 grams per deciliter for that 20 and higher in the 22 and 24. This is just four years of the data. You can see here, on the right in the, the blue and red bars, I'm representing milk that was pumped in the first four weeks after giving birth to a baby prior to 36 weeks. That's nutritionally preterm infant. And the milk in red is milk that was pumped by a mom after that time period, even if she gave birth to a preterm infant or she gave birth to a full-term infant. It's not quite the same, but 20.1 versus 20.8 calories per ounce. You can see the lactose is almost across the board the same and the fat looks exactly the same, 3.5 grams per deciliter. But this is on average, the range of fat actually is from about 1.2 grams per deciliter to about six grams per, per deciliter. It has to do with lots of things in her life, but also how she's pumping and storing her milk. So we educate the moms. Now this thing all the way over on the left, this thing we can't control is the protein. And look at the difference between a mom who gives birth prematurely and a mom who gives birth full term. 1.3 grams per deciliter is the average protein in the mom who gives birth prematurely and is pumping in the first four weeks. That's a big difference. And who are we prioritizing feeding in the NICU? The preterm infant. So that meant that in our outreach to hospitals and communities, that we specifically target moms who are successfully lactating who have given birth prematurely so that we can make sure that we've got good protein content. But this is a challenge. We also make pools of milk that are a minimum of three different donors per pool. This has a lot to do with reaching those targeted calories and targeted protein levels, but it also has to do with research that's emerging about the human milk oligosaccharides. There are hundreds of them. We've identified a fraction of them, and we've identified a fraction of those that specifically seem to, to impact neck, to prevent neck. And we've identified that not everybody's milk contains those very specific HMOs. So by mixing multiple donors together, 
we not only reach our targeted caloric and protein standards, but we are mixing the moms together in order to statistically, because we don't have a rapid test yet, get the protective HMOs in every bottle of milk to help those babies as much as possible. Let's talk about you. This is a really hard to see slide and I'm really sorry. I made these changes a couple of days ago when I said, oh, I'm going to talk to Georgia. So let me make it very specific. But if you look really, really closely, you can see that there are dark dots that represent the hospitals that use milk from the mother's milk bank at Austin. So pasteurized donor human milk. And there are red dots, sorry, just the opposite, green dots that represent depots, milk collection sites in and around Atlanta, where moms who go through the screening process remotely, of course, and pass and become donors can drop off their milk. These depots are run by volunteers in your hospitals who allow the moms to come in, show their ID, drop off milk. They report to us every Monday what the volume of milk is in their freezer. And when it's at least 50% full, they then ship the milk to us at our expense, of course, so that we can have enough milk. And so you must ask yourself as you are preparing to begin a milk bank yourself, what is the supply and demand? So here's the supply and demand. So volume by hospital, 2020 to 2022, we served seven hospitals in 2020. We now uh, serve eight. That's a minor difference, but I like details. In 2020, we, when we first started, we served just under 42, provided just under 42,000 ounces. That's how much those hospitals asked for. What you need to ask yourself is that, is whether or not that's all that should have been asked for. Or was it more than should have been asked for? We don't evaluate that. Hospitals request donor human milk. We provide them with the donor human milk they request. 2022 saw a dip in the use of pasteurized donor human milk. Maybe that reflected the fact that, that I was sending out uh, electronic news and messages saying, gee, our supply is really diminishing in 2022 order what you need, not what you want. Um, I don't know what that's about. Maybe you had fewer preterm infants born in 2022. And if so, I want you to tell me your secret. I don't know what that's about, but that's how much demand uh, Georgia had over the last three years in those eight hospitals. Now there are other milk banks serving some of the Georgia hospitals, one and two and three. Not many, but nonetheless, um, this isn't the full demand. This is just what I can see. Then the volume by depot. So how many women in those communities heard about the ability to donate their surplus milk, went through the screening process successfully and dropped off their milk? So this is not to point out who had a little milk and who had a lot of milk. Um, that was one of the reasons I debated not doing this. But in 2022, uh, there were 70 donors who were dropping off at your local depots. Three were in remote areas or at least said that the depot locations were not convenient to them or they had transportation barriers. So we sent them materials and they were able to ship from their home instead. But of the 70, you can see that uh, they dropped off at these four depots. And there's a big difference between how many milk donors are using each depot. I'll show you the individual data, but there are, there are a number of reasons the, for this. I mean, it could be that everybody lives around Wellstar Keniston Hospital and makes extra milk, and the people who live around Wellstar Douglas Hospital are barely making any milk, and so they couldn't possibly be donors. But I don't actually believe that. So what I actually believe is that some hospitals engaging in having a depot put out community messages about how important breastfeeding is. They provide lactation support. They promote breastfeeding in the community. 
And when women say, hey, with my last baby, ugh, I produced gallons of extra milk and had to pour it down the sink or give it to Aunt Mary or give it to my neighbor or dump it in the garden, um, someone at that hospital says, uh, gee, you should really be a milk donor. You could save some babies' lives at the same time that you're helping your own. I don't know. It's something to be explored, definitely. But take a look at these differences. Because as you um, begin to open depots or assume depots when you have a milk bank, you need to think about that. This is uh, 12 months, labeled 1 through 12, January through December. And you can see that the mil incoming milk volume is not uniform. This is important. Here's Emery. This one has taken a total tank. Here's Wellstar Crab, sometimes huge amounts, sometimes little amounts, and Wellstar Douglas, I don't know what's going on there, and I'm not going to pick on them. Before I talk to you about one particular challenge, I have the five-minute warning, so, so we're going to wrap this up. The point of looking at these individual statistics is that the success of the depot depends on you. You at the individual hospitals, what message are you giving to the community? How rigorous is that message? Are we passively handing out a brochure that says, breast milk is best for you and your baby, I hope you breastfeed. Are we making lactation consultants available in the hospital and after the hospital as well? In Texas, believe me, we don't do this well. So I have a whole team of people who work for the milk bank, who teach breastfeeding education in a group setting and give individual lactation support to any family who's Medicaid eligible, to any economically vulnerable family, because we don't do it well. So I want you to do it better. So just think about that. You will have some challenges. When you open your milk bank, I want you to do it smartly. I want you to talk to legislators today. And you can take this presentation and talk to the legislators about kids like KM. Full term, seven pounds, 12 ounces. Who doesn't love that? Mom's milk dried when she had to go back to work. You know, we still don't have paid maternity leave. You do if you work for me, but not in the country. So she's not allowed to pump at work. She tried formula. She quit work after three months because the baby was having issues. The baby wasn't growing. growing. The baby had developed a severe eczema. Lots of problems. Pediatrician diagnosed formula intolerance, wrote the prescription. The prescription came to me. It's a big baby now, 36 ounces per day. The baby needed the milk for five months. In Texas, when we opened MMBA, we went to the legislators right away and said, hey, make sure Medicaid covers donor human milk in the community when there's a medical need. If we get specific diagnostic codes, you have to cover it because otherwise we can't serve the community. And so kids like this, they're just going to go away. No kids should go away. We contacted Peach State Health Plan, which is a Medicaid eligible person. They authorized pasteurized donor human milk. I know to just think that's adorable, but that doesn't actually mean that they'll pay. And sure enough, by the end of serving this baby for five months, we had provided $26,000 worth of pasteurized donor human milk. PDHM from MMBA, our processing fee is $4.65 per ounce. It's reflective of what it takes to make the milk safe. We have a charitable care fund. We raise money um, for these cases. So we were able to cover it um, without blinking. You have to think about this. As you open your milk bank, please think about this. And I now have exactly one minute to say that other challenges, which mean that a lot of us are deeply involved in research, is that milk varies, raw milk varies in its macronutrient content, in its micronutrient content, we think, but that's current research. Could it differ in its macronutrient in response to the viruses that we are exposed to? That's current research. How do we keep a consistent product coming out of the milk banks? How do we limit the microbiology? How do we limit the bacterial contamination? 
How do we keep meeting our nutrient target goals? How do we make sure that our micronutrients are met for these particular babies? How do we make sure that all of these HMOs are in every single bottle of milk? And how do we appreciate the fact that when you breastfeed your infant, that's perfect. When we make pasteurized donor human milk, you express your milk and you store your milk and freeze your milk and you ship or transport your milk. And then we thaw that milk and we test that milk and we process that milk and we freeze that milk. And then you in the hospitals thaw that milk and you feed that milk also. There are compromises. We get rid of the live cells. That's actually a good thing. We get rid of the bacteria and viruses. Good things. We get rid of 100% of the lipase. I hate that. Kids don't absorb as much fat from the PDHM as from their mother's raw breast milk. We should fix that. We reduce IgM, lysozyme, EPO, zinc, leptin. We should fix those things, challenges. I'm gonna keep going. It's not accessible to everyone. I have exactly zero seconds. Work on accessibility issues. The fact that I've been around for 24 years in milk banking and can raise funds for charitable care, work on legislation and give free breastfeeding classes and lactation support is great. It's not feasible in your first year or two probably as a milk bank, but it's going to be feasible. So make the plans now. When you have a milk bank, you won't be cut off from our services if you need our services. So keep that in mind, but make the plans now. I'll help you with the legislation. Let's make it happen. Lots and lots of challenges remain, but the main challenge to all of us was said so perfectly by the Surgeon General in 2011, human milk's vital to the survival of infants and plays an important role in addressing the substantial burden imposed by NEC on affected families and in reducing healthcare costs associated with NEC. We can't not do this. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry to run over.